In his 2014 bestseller, Sapiens, author Yuval Noah Harari looked at the 75,000 year history of humankind. His new book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, he picks up that story and looks at whether our future leads down a path to our own obsolescence. And Yuval Noah Harari joins us now. It's nice to have you here at TVO. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Just in case uh, everybody's Latin is not as sharp as yours is, do you want to translate the title for us? Homo Deus, yes. It's basically God-man. And it implies that in the 21st century, humankind is going to try and upgrade itself uh, into, into a god. And this is not meant as a metaphor, but it means literally we are in the process of acquiring for ourselves divine abilities. Um, in the Bible, God, the, th the first thing God does is to create animals and plants and humans according to his wishes. And now we are learning how to engineer and manufacture animals and plants and humans according to our wishes. And it's very likely that in the 21st century, the main product of the economy will not be uh, textiles and vehicles and weapons. They will be bodies and brains and minds. Before we get to that, you'll forgive my confusion about the subtitle, <clears throat> because I always thought historians wrote about yesterday, and you're now talking about a brief history of tomorrow. Want yes. to explain that? Uh, yes, I think it's, it's the, the logical extension. I mean, we don't learn history just to understand the past. The past is gone, everybody is dead, all the issues are resolved one way or the other. I mean, if it doesn't tell us something about the future, then it's not really worth the effort. But Yuval, if you asked somebody from the year 1900, tell us what the world's going to be like in 100 years, they would not have a clue of mm. how things had turned out. So what value do you think there is in trying to speculate, never mind 100 years down the road, 50 years down the road, 25 years down the road, mm -hmm. on what the future history of our world is going to be? Well, the truth is that nobody has a clue how the world would look like in 30 or 50 years, including myself. Uh, nobody knows, for example, what the job market would look like, which is why nobody knows what we should teach children at school. Uh, and my book is definitely not a book of prophecies and forecasts about the future. It's, it tries to map different possibilities. And if you don't like some of these possibilities, you can still, still do something about it. Well, this is what's interesting about it, is that if you pick up any newspaper anywhere in the world, it is filled on a daily basis with the worst doom and gloom going. And yet, if you read your book, you think we're living in the best of times. You want to explain that? Yes, definitely. At least for a human perspective, if we put the other animals aside, um, today, for the first time in history, more people die from eating too much than from eating too little. In fact, there is no longer any natural famine in the world. All the famine in the world today is just political famine. Uh, previously, people died because there, is not, there was not enough food. There was some natural catastrophe, like drought or like earthquake, and there was not enough food and people died. Today, if somebody starves to death, it's only because some politician wants them to starve to death. Hmm. So famine is basically solved. Similarly, if you look at plagues and at ep epidemics, today for the first time in history, more people die from old age than from infectious disease. And if you look at violence, more people today die from suicide than from war and crime and terrorism put together. I hear you on that, and, I, and I, I, you know, the numbers do support what <clears> you're saying. But when you, again, when you pick up the paper and you look about Afghanistan and Syria mm. and Iraq and Yemen and so many other places around the world, it really does not look like we've figured out this war thing very well. Would you agree? Well, I'm not saying that there are no longer any conflicts and any violence. I come from Israel, so I know perfectly well that there is still a lot of violence in the world. I'm just saying we're in a better position than at any previous time in history. And even though there are some troubled spots, like the Middle East, in much of the world, there is unprecedented peace. Uh, if you look, for example, at Canada, the chances of the average Canadian being killed uh, by a terrorist attack is about a thousand times less than the chances of dying from eating too much at McDonald's. Okay, but what about plague? The average Canadian, not that long ago, mm -hmm. 13 years ago, the average Canadian had a had it turned out a pretty good chance of dying of SARS. 
Uh, we had 44 people in this city die of SARS. Uh, there were, uh, sadly, hundreds of people in, in Toronto who died of AIDS mm -hmm. uh, before that. Uh, let's go further afield, Ebola in West Africa, which was certainly a problem for a while, thankfully not spreading to the rest of the world. Uh, we haven't quite got that figured out yet either, though, do we? No, I mean, it's not as we can completely prevent the outbreak of disease or death from disease. Again, like with violence, I'm saying the situation is much better than any previous time, not that it is perfect. And if you compare, for example, Ebola with the Black Death, um, Ebola killed about 10,000 people altogether. In Africa? In Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think all over the world. I mean, a few cases okay. outside Africa as well. The Black Death killed about a third of the human population in Asia, Africa, and Europe mm -hmm. at the time. So it's a disaster on a completely different scale. When Ebola started, there were experts who feared that this is the start of a new Black Death. But uh, quite quickly, the, health, the global health authorities managed to bring the epidemic under control. If Ebola erupted, say, 200 or 100 years ago, the death toll would probably be in the millions, not in the tens of thousands. Understood. In which case, if our old preoccupation was with famine or plague or random violence of that kind, what do you think our new preoccupation going forward will be? Well, the first big preoccupation will be to overcome old age and death. Uh, immortality will be one of the big issues of the 21st century, and it's already beginning now, uh, and not just in the lunatic fringes, but also in the centers of science and of business. Uh, Google established two years ago a subcompany called Calico, whose declared aim is to find a solution to death. The same way we find solution to search, now we'll find a solution to death. And they are not alone. More and more scientists are basically saying that death is not a metaphysical problem. Death is not some divinely ordained part of, of the human condition. Death is basically a technical problem. And even though it's a very complicated technical problem, it can be solved with technical solutions. You don't need to wait for God a couple of geeks in a laboratory can do it if you give them enough time and enough money. Here's the quote from your book. Our ideological commitment to human life, you say, <clears throat> will never allow us to accept human death. Why are we at a point in our existence as human beings where we are starting to want to cheat death? Uh, people always wanted to overcome death. This is not something new. The oldest epics in, in history, like the Gilgamesh epic from ancient Mesopotamia, tell about people who want to overcome death. Okay, but now but, apparently we think there's something we can actually do about it. Exactly. I mean, previously people had to postpone these hopes for the afterlife. After you die, you live forever in paradise. But mm -hmm. now come the scientists and they say, you don't have to wait for supernatural help after you die. Uh, you can rely on new technology biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and so forth, to overcome death and create paradise here on Earth. I'm not saying that this will actually happen in the 21st century, but I am saying that this will become one of the major new projects of scientists and of humankind in general. Can we blue sky this a bit and figure out how it's going to work? I, I, I mean, at some point, the body gives out once it's been around long enough. So are you talking about an immortality where the brain somehow is transplanted to some other kind of vessel and our spirit or our, our sense continues on forever? There are basically three ways in which you can do it. You can use uh, biological engineering to change or upgrade your biological body. You can use cyborg engineering, which is a combine, combine your body with inorganic parts, with bionic parts, whether it's hands or eyes or tiny robots inside your cells and your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And the third way is what you mentioned, which is the creation of completely inorganic life forms, including the possibility of uploading human consciousness mm -hmm. into a computer. Now, again, nobody really knows what will come out of these hopes, but we may be on the verge of creating the first inorganic life forms after four billion years of organic revolution. 
For four billion years, life was confined to the relatively small realm of organic compounds. And within the next century, it may for the first time break out into the inorganic realm. And if this happens, it will be not just the greatest revolution in history, it will be the greatest revolution in biology since the very beginning of life. I presume we are after this because we are in constant pursuit of happiness. And the assumption is if you are immortal, you have a chance of being happy forever. Is it possible that one of the keys to human happiness is the knowledge that this ride does come to an end at some point and you do have to get off the Ferris wheel? Um, some philosophers and uh, thinkers say so, but if you look throughout human history, most humans did not like this idea of <laughs> coming off the Ferris wheel. <laughs> so they all the time came up with these stories and fantasies that yes, this physical body eventually decays and decomposes, but part of me, the important part, somehow continues forever, either via reincarnation or rebirth in a new body, or by uh, going to some heaven or paradise after we die. So again, the, it's not something new, it's just the means of accomplishing it in, is new. You can say that what we are seeing today is the emergence of kind of techno-religions, religions that make all the old promises of happiness and justice and eternal life, but here on earth with the help of technology and not after you die with the help of supernatural beings. But you've written this. These are your thoughts. They will be on library bookshelves all over the world. They will be in homes all over the world. The President of the United States said, that's a good book, I gotta, you know, and he recommended your book, mm -hmm. Barack Obama. Is that not enough immortality for you? Um, well, for me personally, it's, it's, it's a very different question. Um, many people compose books, uh, produce movies and so forth in the hope that this will provide them uh, with some kind of immortality. But Woody Allen, when he was asked <laughs> I love uh, if he wants to live forever through, uh, through his movies, then he replied, I would prefer to live only in my apartment. <laughs> and right. I think this is just another kind of, uh, kind of fantasy. To live forever in your creation, it's not, it's not the real thing. Hmm. Do you worry about the ethics of all of this? Uh, very much so. I think that ethics is going to be extremely important in the 21st century because technology will present us with enormous powers and uh, frightening possibilities. And if we don't have a good ethical basis, then we can make terrible decisions. Mm. And what should be very obvious is that with the same technology, you can create completely different kinds of societies. Mm. And this is not something new, of course, with the technology of the Industrial Revolution with trains and electricity and oil, you could create a communist dictatorship, a fascist regime, or a liberal democracy. And the choice between them is not technological. The choice between, between them is ethical. And it's the same thing with biotechnology and artificial intelligence. They don't mandate a single deterministic future. There are choices to be made. And if we want to think about these choices from an ethical perspective, the results could be disastrous. Well, we've already, I, I, you know, there have been some fairly popular movies mm -hmm. over the years considering genetically engineered super children uh, whom one could fear would grow up and who knows what, take over the world, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, this suddenly is not science fiction. This could be science fact if, if what you predict is a logical extension of our future, right? Well, you can have even far more simple scenarios uh, the rise of artificial intelligence, even without genetic engineering, is already threatening of pushing more and more humans out of the job market. So mm. within 20 or 30 years, we may see the rise of a new massive class, the useless class, just as the Industrial Revolution created the urban working class. So the new revolution will create the useless class. People who are not just unemployed, but unemployable, and the social and political implication of that could be catastrophic. You could have billions of people 
without uh, economic importance and without political power. Those are the seeds of a revolution. All the seeds of a very frightening dystopia. Yeah. But again, I want to emphasize it's not a prophecy, mm -hmm. it's just a possibility. Mm -hmm. If we don't like this possibility, now is the time to start doing something about it. So is this what you refer to when you write the rise of humanism also contains the scenes of its downfall? In a way, yes. I mean, we pursue all these technologies like AI and like biotechnology in the hope that they will serve humankind and they will give us better health, happier lives, and so forth. But the result may be to make most humans redundant. Mm. If you want better health, so you create a kind of artificial intelligence that understands your body and your brain better than you can ever understand them so that it can provide you with better health. But once you have an AI that understands you better than you understand yourself, you are becoming redundant. The AI can do everything better than you can, and then you, we, you, we have a world in which humans are not the most powerful and the focus of attention. Humans are becoming just yesterday's news, the previous stage of evolution, and what, now there is something new. So if that future happens, the end of humanism, if you like, what's going to replace it? What could replace it? One of the things that could replaces, re replace it is an ideology uh, which we can call dataism, which is already becoming dominant in places like Silicon Valley, which says the, the all of existence, the whole universe is just a flow of data. And all phenomena in the universe, including tomatoes and giraffes and human beings, are just different ways of processing data. Uh, for thousands of years, humans, what are the best algorithms in the world, the best data processing system in the world. But now we have better data processing systems. We are creating the kind of internet of all things. And this becomes much more important than humans. And we may well see within a few decades authority shifting away from humans to these algorithms. If, if the scenario you have just <clears throat> posited happens, What's the output of the new world of dataism you have described? Um, the output, again, the output of humankind is the creation of these superior algorithms, mm. a superior data processing system. What will be the out oh. output of that system is, by definition, beyond the ability of humans to understand or to imagine. Our brains mm. are a data processing system that evolved in the African savanna 70,000 years ago. Now we are creating something far, far more powerful. By definition, our old-fashioned, obsolete algorithms are incapable of understanding what's next. Hmm. How old are you? I'm 40. So you're a young guy still. You'll, you'll <clears throat> probably be around to see some of this happen. Does that excite you or frighten you, or what does it do? Well, it's happening already today. I mean, if you speak about authority shifting from humans to algorithm, it's all around us. Uh, if you navigate your way around the city, you, don't, you no longer rely on your own intuitions and knowledge. You rely on your smartphone to tell you where to go. When you go to buy a book, you rely on Amazon. Very soon, you'll rely on Amazon and Google to choose your dates and to vote in the elections. So it's not some distant future. It's mm. already happening as we speak. Um, personally, I try to be neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but realist, mm. to see what is happening and to understand that every change, every big change in history has both positive and negative potential. There is almost no case of a big revolution with just positive or just negative mm. potential. And the key thing is to make technology serve us and not us serving technology. In which case, in our last minute, let me do what the title of your book suggests. Let me make this man God for a moment here. If you could, if you could wave that magic wand and have one thing happen in the future for certain of what you've described here, what would it be? To understand what consciousness is. The one big thing that we still don't understand 
and which is the key to most of the big questions, especially the ethical questions, is to understand consciousness. We are devoting immense amounts of efforts and time and money to researching the brain and the body and intelligence and creating artificial intelligence, but we don't understand the mind in contrast to the brain. We don't understand consciousness, and my big fear is that we will upgrade our bodies and our brains and lose our minds in the process. Hmm. This is an absolutely fascinating book, and we should tell everybody you wrote it originally in Hebrew, which is your first language, and then did another version in English with, I guess, um, North American examples and British examples and so and on. And all kinds of updates. Yes, yes. an update. So uh, an absolutely fascinating read. Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow. Yes, you can have a history of tomorrow. Todaraba. Thank you. Litrat. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.